Responsive design in CSS is incredibly important, and you may think if you understand media queries, you understand responsive design, but there is so much more to responsive design than just simple media queries. In this video, I'm going to be covering about 10 different topics on how you can improve your responsive design skills. Some of them are going to be related to media queries, but many of them aren't even using media queries at all. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream projects sooner. And to get started with this video, I'm gonna cover some of the more simple concepts and then towards the end, we're gonna talk about some of the more advanced concepts that don't even use media queries at all. Now the very first responsive design concept you need to understand actually starts in your HTML and that is this simple meta tag right here for your viewport. If I remove this line of code, my site on mobile is going to look very weird. So right now I'm using a mobile version of my site as you can see. And if I just remove this line of code and save, you'll see it looks like everything's working just fine, but let's add in some text. Let's just say we're gonna add in a bunch of text. Now you can see that my page scrolls horizontally, which is definitely not ideal. And you've seen websites like this all the time. While if I just come in here and I bring that line back in, add my text in, and I do a save now, you can see all of my text is fitting on the page exactly as I expect. So what this line of code does, I'm essentially breaking it down, is it's saying that the width of your screen should be the same width as your device. So no matter what size my screen is, or what size my phone is, the width of my content is always going to be the same as the width of my device. And this initial scale right here, it tells you what type of zoom level you want to be at when you load in your page for the very first time. So let's change this to three, for example. And all I'm going to do just to show what this would look like is I'm gonna to toggle off mobile view and then toggle it back on. And now you can see my page is way more zoomed in than before, it's three times zoomed in. If I change that back to one, and then I just do a quick inspect real quick so I can get that back, toggle it off and back on. Now you can see I'm back to one time zoom. So the reason we put this into our page is to make sure our width is perfect and we make sure that we're not excessively zoomed in or zoomed out. So it's just defaulting to a normal zoom level. Now the next concept that I wanna cover is going to be a concept for media queries. So if we just come down here and I define a media query and this media query, I could say like min width, 200 pixels, and then I could change my box to have a background of red. So now you can see since we're above 200 pixels, the background is red. That's pretty straightforward. Let's change it to like 500 pixels real quick. Now you can see that we have a purple background. And if we just inspect our page, and we go back over into that mobile view. There we go. Now we can actually just move this around and you can see based on my screen size, my box is changing colors. Super straightforward, everybody understands this. But something that you may not know is you can actually do more than just check widths. For example, you can check orientation inside of here. So if I just type in orientation, I could say landscape. And now whenever I'm in the landscape orientation, so essentially my page is wider than it is tall, you can see the box turns to red and I could change this to portrait. There we go. And now whenever my height is taller than my width, it's going to be that media query. So this is really useful if you're on like a tablet or if you're on a phone, you can swap between portrait and landscape. Or if you just want to determine which direction is wider, is it wider or is it taller? It's a really useful media query. Another really cool thing you can do is media queries on aspect ratios. So I could say min aspect ratio is like one to one, for example. And now if I just give this a quick save, when my aspect ratio here is above one to one, essentially my width is wider than my height. That's what one to one is saying. You can see this box has changed to red. I could also do something like 16 by nine. So once my width expands past that 16 by nine ratio, for example, if I really shrink down the height here, you can see the box again changes back to red. Now there's a ton of different stuff you can do in this media query. Another one is like prefers reduced motion. There's a bunch of preferences based on people's like motion preferences or data preferences. Those don't really have to do as much with responsive design, but it's still important to know because it's important to cater your website towards people that want things like high contrast colors or animations or lack thereof. Now the next three concepts that I wanna talk about are all somewhat experimental with varying levels of browser support. I'll cover all the different browser supports when we get to that point. But the very first one I wanna talk about is how you can do ranges with CSS media queries. So normally you would write something like min width 200 pixels, you know, or whatever it is, 300 pixels. And then based on our width, you can see that our box is changing colors. But this is a little bit difficult for me to read personally, so I much prefer to do something along the lines of width is greater than or equal to 300 pixels. That is essentially going to do the exact same thing. Once our width is greater than or equal to 300 pixels, our box is red, and below that our box is purple. But this is much easier to read, so we have the ability to do greater than, equal to, greater than or equal to, we have less than, less than or equal to, and we even have equal to if you really want, but it almost serves no purpose at all. And best of all is you can actually combine these together. So you could say like 100 pixels is less than or equal to our width and our width is less than or equal to 300. So now when we're between 100 and 300 pixels, you can see our box is that red color 
and then when we're less than 100 or above 300, it changes back to purple. Now, as for browser support on this, let me just drag this over. As you can see, the browser support is currently 71%, and the only browser we're waiting on here is Safari. All the other browsers support it. So hopefully this will come in relatively soon, but if you don't want to wait, you can use a plugin like Post CSS. They have the ability to do these range syntaxes, and it'll just convert your CSS from the range syntax to the old syntax, and it'll work exactly the same, and it'll work on all browsers. Now, the next concept I want to talk about has even better browser support. It's really almost entirely there, and that is container queries, which is one of my favorite new features in CSS. I actually have a full video covering it linked in the cards and description, but I'll give you a really short example of what it is. So let's just come into our code and let's just add in a simple sidebar. And inside that sidebar, let's add a box and we can just get rid of this Lorem Ipsum text. We don't really need that right now. So what we can do, just expand this out so we can see what we're doing. We can create our sidebar. And for our sidebar, let's just give it a width of 20%. And we're gonna come in here and we're gonna give it a border on the left of 200 pixels. And then we wanna make sure that our body here is going to be a display of flex, just so they're gonna show up side by side. So we'll just say display flex, just like that. So now our sidebar takes up 20% of the width of our screen. And what we can do is we can just get rid of this mobile view so things are a little bit easier to see. So it'll be a little bit wider. So let's just get rid of that. There we go. And we'll zoom our page out a little bit. There we go. Now let me fix my border here. This should obviously be one pixel solid black instead of that 200 pixels. There we go. So now we have our border on the left or on the, yeah, right there on the left. And let's also give our boxes a little bit of margin so we can just see what they look like, 20 pixels. There we go. So we have a box on the right-hand side and a box on the left-hand side. And you can see that they're pretty big. We'll shrink them down a little bit. Let's do 100 by 100. There we go. Now we have our two different boxes inside of our different containers. Also, one last thing that we should probably do is we're gonna wrap this normal box inside of some like main container. And then we can just come into our CSS. We can say dot main flex grow one. There we go. Let's just save both of those. And now you can see this box on the left-hand side is filling up a lot of space. And this box on the right-hand side is pushed to the side. We can make our sidebar a little bigger. Let's do like 30%. There we go. So we essentially have our sidebar and our main content. Now this is fine when you just have like one page, but what happens if you wanna have a component in your main section like this purple box, and we wanna have a component in our sidebar section, and we wanna change this component based on how much space it has. Because if our screen is, for example, you know, really large like this, you can see that we have lots of space on the left, but not too much space on the right. So our media queries would all be for large screen sizes, but this component on the right actually doesn't have that much space. So we wanna be able to say, how much space does this have inside of its container and size it or change it based on that. So what we're gonna do is instead of using a media query, because for example, I could say like media query width is greater than or equal to, let's say 600 pixels. So when we're larger than 600 pixels, our boxes are going to be red. So if we expand this, you can see once we get to this point, our boxes both turn red. Let's say this red styling was like adding additional content. Well, on this right-hand side, there's not enough space for that additional content, but it's still showing up as red in our scenario because our whole page is larger than 600 pixels. Instead, we can change this to an at container query. And this right here is going to say, use the container you're inside of to determine your actual width. Then all that we need to do is we need to tell our boxes or our container query what the container is. So we have our main container and our sidebar. These are both our containers. So we can just say that the container type for these is going to be an inline size. And now if I give that a quick save and I change this to something like, let's say 400 pixels, you can see this left-hand section, this main content is larger than 400 pixels. So it shows up as red, while this box over here is in a container that's less than 400 pixels. So you can see it shows as purple still. And once our entire page shrinks down where the main content is also less than 400 pixels, you can see that changes to purple. This is really useful, especially when you're using like component-based libraries like React. And again, I'd highly recommend you check out the full video of me covering this because there's so much more than just what I'm covering here. Now, as for browser support, it's surprisingly good. You may see this number of 73% and think that's not that great, but if you look here, it's actually supported in every single main browser and even Firefox just rolled out support for this very recently in the newest version. So just given a little bit of time, maybe a couple months, hopefully this will be you know up to like 90% support because it'll be in every browser. You can just see here if we check usage relative, the main thing is like older versions of Safari like iOS aren't quite updated yet. And again, some of the Safari and Firefox browsers have not been quite updated to the newest versions. But give it a couple months, like I said, and this should be closer to that 90% number and ready for use. Now, the last somewhat experimental thing I want to talk about is custom media queries. And unfortunately, this one has by far the worst browser support. So let's actually just get rid of all this additional code. Just go back to that box that we had before. I'm going to get rid of all of the stuff that we have up here. We don't need any of that. There we go. And let's just make our box perfectly fine. That's how it is. And we'll change this back to a media query. 
Most often when you're dealing with media queries, you're going to have queries that you repeat everywhere. For example, your width greater than 400 pixels, maybe that's just a size you repeat everywhere in your application. But it's a huge pain to have to, you know, copy this down a bunch of times and write all your media queries like this. Instead, what would be nice is we can just take this and turn it into a variable and reuse it everywhere. And that's the idea behind the at custom media property where you can define a custom media query and this will just be able to be used anywhere. So we can say at custom media, then we give it a name dash dash, let's just say small. And then we just define what it is. So in our case, width greater than 400 pixels. And then all you need to do is take that variable you've used and pass that in anywhere you have this in your media query. So all the places you use that media query, you would pass this in and that would give you your media query for this. Now, actually this should probably be called big instead of large or small, but anyway, there you go. That's how this would work. But of course there is no browser support at all for this right now. This is currently in stage two, so it's somewhat stable and you can use something like post CSS again, like I've mentioned to use this live in your site. And if you want to learn how you can do that with post CSS, I actually have a full video on how to set up post CSS. I'll link in the cards and description for you. But unfortunately, like I said, this doesn't have any support right now, but I'm really hoping since this has been in the spec for years that it'll get adopted by more browsers because I'm really looking forward to having something like this available. Now that right there is the last media query related thing I want to talk about. And the next few are going to go pretty quickly because they're not too complicated. The first and easiest way to do CSS styling without using a bunch of media queries is to just do different HTML for mobile and different HTML for desktop. This is really only applicable if you have really complex HTML that is drastically different on mobile and on desktop. So like a really complex navigation that has a ton of features on desktop and a little bit simpler navigation on mobile that's also pretty complex. Then what you would do is you would write all your HTML for one and you'd give it a class like mobile only and you would give your other one a class like desktop only and then you would just have a really simple media query that's like on the small screen sizes mobile only is going to be visible or i guess technically what we would do is on the large screen sizes we would say display none for mobile and then on the small screen sizes, we would say display, display none for the desktop. That's all you do. So that's the simplest thing that you can do. But in 99% of the cases, you probably shouldn't do that because it's just extra HTML and extra problems that you can have. This is why you want to use some of the tools built into the CSS that allow you to do responsive design without needing a bunch of media queries. The first one I want to talk about is actually going to be CSS grid. This is perfect for doing a bunch of responsive design. So I'm going to come in here. I'm just going to say dot grid. Whoops, dot grid. There we go. I'm going to move the box inside of there. And I'm actually just going to copy down a bunch of different boxes. There we go. So now we have a bunch of different boxes inside our grid. And you can see that they are on the right hand side of our screen. I'm going to remove all of this code that we have except for our box. And for our grid, I'm just going to change the display here to grid. Now this won't change anything in our code, but we can set up grid template columns. And let's say that you wanted to have like three columns that are going to be all the same size. So you could repeat three, one FR, and there you go, now you have three equal sized columns. Now this is great, but as your screen size changes, maybe you shrink it down, you'll notice it doesn't look super great, or as you grow it really large, it doesn't look super great. So one of the best things that you can do, instead of hard coding a value here for the number you want to repeat, you can make this automatic by saying it's either gonna auto fill or it's going to auto fit. And these both will automatically determine the number of columns you need to fit exactly the content you want. And to determine the size of your element, you can use a min max here where you give it a minimum and a maximum value. So let's say at a minimum, we want this to just be 200 pixels. We never want it to be smaller than 200 pixels. And then we can just say we want it to grow to be any size one FR. So now if we give this a quick save and we'll just change the minimum here actually to 100 pixels. Now all we need to do to get this to actually work properly is just give our grid, grid a width of 100% because by default it's not taking up the full width of our body and we'll remove the margin from our body. So we'll just say margin zero here. Now you can see that all of our boxes are showing up right next to each other. Let's remove the margin from them and remove the hard coded width so it'll be automatically determined by the actual container. And then we'll just add some gap into our grid. We'll just say one REM. There we go. So now you can see we have our different boxes and no matter what size my screen is, these boxes are going to grow and shrink in size until they cannot get any smaller and then it's going to move them to the next line. Or when it grows, it's going to grow until it has room to put a new box on the line. So you can see automatically the containers are determining how many boxes I can put on a row. And this is all with just one single line of CSS. 
Now the difference between auto fit and auto fill is pretty minimal. As you can see, they look pretty much exactly the same, but there is one difference. In order to see that difference, we actually need to remove some of the boxes because we, this difference is only determined when the actual width of your container is large enough that you can fit everything in one row. So you can see with auto fill, as I change the size of my screen, every time we have space to add a new box or a new column, it's adding that column. As you can see, our boxes are kind of pretending there's invisible boxes there. While if we change this to auto fit instead, you can see that now we're not adding additional columns beyond what the maximum level number of contents we have. So we have two boxes, so we'll never have more than two columns. That's why they're growing so large. But with auto fill, our grid is currently having a bunch of columns right now, like four or five different columns to fill the entire width of our container. And that just makes sure all of your different elements, even if there's only a few of them, all never become too large. Now, if we just take this back to what we had before with a bunch of different boxes, another really important thing that you need to know about how you can use grid is the ability to do grid auto for the rows and for the columns. In our case, we've defined our columns, so we're gonna make our rows automatic, and we're gonna say that they're going to be 100 pixels tall. Now we can remove the height from our box and that height is gonna be determined by our auto row right here. So if we change this to like 200 pixels now, you can see every single row that we add to our container is going to be 200 pixels tall or maybe 50 pixels tall. And every time we add a new row automatically, it's going to be that exact height of 50 pixels, 200 pixels, whatever you define. This is again, really important for responsive design because we don't know how many rows we're gonna have. It's dependent upon how many different elements we have as well as how wide or small our screen is. So this allows us to take into account anything possible with how many elements we have and how large our screen is and make sure it looks exactly like we want, again, without any media queries at all. Now, if you're unfamiliar with CSS Grid, I have a full video covering it. I'll link in the cards in the description so you can really deep dive into this concept. Now let's go back to when we just had exactly one box. So let's just get rid of all these additional boxes. We don't need our grid anymore. And we can come in here and I want my box to have a width, 200 pixels, height, 200 pixels, there we go. And we can get rid of all this grid code. Now one thing you're already probably super familiar with is the ability to do things like a min width. Let's say we want the min width here to be 100 pixels. We'll do a max width, which we're gonna set to 300 pixels. And then you can specify an actual width, which in our case we'll set to, let's say 75% of our screen size. So now what's going to happen is this box is going to be 75% of our screen size until it reaches the max width, which in our case is 300 pixels. Let's make it a little bigger, like 500. So you can see as we expand our screen, once we get to the point where we're at that 500 pixels, the box never gets bigger. Now when we shrink down our screen, you can see that it stayed at 75% of the width of our screen until we reach our min width, which if we change this to something like 300 pixels, we can see that a little bit better because as you can see here, we're at 300 pixels and now the box is not shrinking down. This is a really common use case for min, max, and normal width, but you can only do this on a few properties, which is why the clamp property is so useful. The clamp property here, what we can do is we can just say our width is going to be equal to that clamp, and our clamp has a minimum value, let's say 300 pixels, an actual value, which in our case is 75%, and then we have a maximum value, which in our case is gonna be 500 pixels. And this will do the exact same thing as those min, max, and values, and so on. So as we get our screen larger, you can see once we hit 500 pixels, it stops growing, and if we shrink our screen down as when we hit 300 pixels, you can see again, it stops shrinking down. That's really important because now we can use this with not just widths, but other things such as font size. And this is really common. You may change your font size based on your actual width of your screen. So here you can set a width value like 1.5 VW, and then you can set a maximum value for your font, like let's say two REM and a minimum is gonna be like 0.75 REM. And now your font will always scale between these two values. It'll never be smaller or larger. And as your screen size changes, it's going to change the size of your font. So if we just add some font to our page, we can just say Lorem like 100 or something, a ton of different font to our page right here. As you can see, when our ch page size changes, our font size will change as well. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So we'll do like 3.5 and we'll make the maximum value like 10, and we'll make the minimum value 0.5, so we can really see how this changes in size. And also, let's make sure that we move our font size here into our body. So now you can see, as my screen size gets smaller, my font size is shrinking down. And as my screen size gets larger, my font size is growing. Obviously, this is way more drastic than you would wanna use. You would wanna have a much closer maximum and minimum value, and you would wanna increase it maybe less than 3.5 VW, but that gives you a concept of how this works, and it's really useful for font size because you can scale off of things like your viewport units. Now, the last concept I wanna talk about, I'm actually gonna be using a YouTube video I've already recorded. I'll have it linked up in the description and the comments for you, but essentially, I just wanna talk about the different types of viewport units, the new ones, that are really useful for mobile because as your mobile screen changes in size, 
like when you scroll on a page, the URL bar may shrink on your mobile screen. We have different viewports for handling that. So we have normal viewpoint units. We have an S version, which is like the small version. So whenever that URL bar is shown, that's what will be used as the height of your screen or width. Same thing with large, that's going to be when that view is hidden. And then we have a dynamic one that starts with D that is going to scale based on the actual size of your viewport. So if we play this video here, you can see this gray bar will change in size as I scroll my phone because you can see that URL bar has disappeared while these other bars have stayed stationary because they're already defined as either the large or the small viewport. Like I said, this is a pretty complex topic. I have a full video covering it, which I'll link in the cards and description for you if you want to go more in depth. But it's important to understand these are here if you're doing a lot of really heavy mobile designs that are matter what the actual height of your screen is based on that URL bar being shown or not shown. And that right there is about 10 different responsive design CSS concepts. If you enjoyed this video, you're definitely going to love my videos on container query and those different viewport units. Those are going to be linked right over here. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.